Welcome DOD innovators. Thank you for joining us for today's Innovation Connect. I'm Captain Ashley Hollingsworth, Chief of the Director's Action Group at the Department of the Air Force CDAO. And as your host, I'm thrilled to be a part of this month's edition. Before we dive into today's topic, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you're a NIDA presenter, please keep your camera off and your microphone on mute. If someone has a live microphone while our speaker is presenting, please allow the moderators to mute that microphone. We've had a few instances lately of attendees inadvertently muting the speaker. Also, please limit your questions to today's topic and avoid media related inquiries or commercial like promoting. Finally, our questions for the speaker can, can be submitted through the chat. Today, we'll spotlight the Department of the Air Force Autonomy Data and AI Experiment Experimentation Proving Ground, also known as ADEX. Our speaker and ADEX team lead, Major Riley Livermore, will overview the ADEX and how it operationalizes Autonomy and AI through experimentation founded on CDAO architectures and tenants. Without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed speaker. Major Riley Livermore is the Futures Flight Commander for the 413th Flight Test Squadron and is the experimentation lead for the CDAO's ADEX Proving Ground. Born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, Major Livermore has both a bachelor's and master's degree in aeronautical engineering and is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, Class 158. Major Livermore boasts over a decade of expertise in autonomy and small unmanned aerial systems testing, including assignments at both the Air Force Research Laboratories and the Air Force Test Center. In his current capacity, he oversees an 11-member team that tests electric vertical takeoff and landing of aircraft, autonomy, and AI-enabled airborne systems. We are excited to hear from our speaker today. Major Livermore, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. That's uh, a very kind and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Let me go ahead and share my slide here. All right. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Okay. I want to actually start today's discussion uh, talking about something that is probably well uh, known to people. Uh, oh, sorry, ChatGPT. Uh, and I think it's an informative, um, it's an informative example of what we're trying to build or like what the, could catalyze something from a good idea to, to something that could be you know world changing. So OpenAI was founded in 2016 timeframe, GPT-1, their first large language model they developed in June, 2018. And they made some iterations, GPT-2, GPT-3, over the course of the next four years that were largely, you know, outside of, you know, scientific communities, it was not, it didn't really kind of permeate the zeitgeist of, uh, uh, of the world, honestly. And so what was interesting is, you know, they decided to throw a chat interface in front of this large language model and uh, open I actually didn't think much about it. They didn't think it'd be what it was. It just, uh, it was just something, you know, another kind of a, a small iteration they thought. And, you know, that was November, 2022 and, and over a little over a, a month, they had a hundred million users, which is just absolutely insane. And it, honestly, it kind of, it's changed the course of, it feels like it was like a very much a seismic shift in how the world views AI. Um, I think the that that concept of like putting a chat interface on top of a large language model is uh, exactly what we're trying to get at with ADAX is how can we start kind of grounding these things, creating interfaces that, that people can use it, interact with AI and start testing it in meaningful ways. Uh, and so that's kind of, a, I think, a really informative uh, approach that's kind of if, um, that's that's inspired us. Now, that being said, what tends to happen, at least my experience in the Air Force, is there's a lot of really enterprising, innovative, hard-charging people. They've got a limited number of resources and a kind of a, a problem size they're going to get after. And so you have a lot of things happening in parallel in stovepipes kind of throughout the DAF, right? And so I know the secretary likes to use a, a you know a thousand blooming flowers. But I think what what the the challenge might be for us is, is we can kind of if we try to go at this at this kind of like grassroots level and everyone tries to solve the problem, we're not going to have be able to kind of combine those resources to really make something new, meaningful. And so I think that's where somewhere with the CDO's guidance and having the, the secretary or the DAF level kind of oversight is incredibly important 
And that's where ADAX steps in. Um, so what is ADAX? Uh, ADAX is a joint DAF CDO and AppWorks venture uh, hosted by the 96 Test Wing, which is where you know, Eglin Air Force Base is, that uses experimentation to drive the future of autonomous and AI capabilities. Um, what I kind of, the, the context of this, this presentation really is to kind of go through those different tenets, right, of what kind of comprises what we're trying to build with ADAX. Um, so looking at partnerships, resources, some experiments we're actually doing currently, um, policy and training and education. Uh, of note, I think we see ADAX is really not necessarily, um, like when it talks about policy or training education, we're not actually, we're collecting data and doing experiments that we're hoping to feed back into the policy loop. So that's where like the connection with the CDO is so important. Um, and AppWorks is such a, a crucial ally too, because there are conduit to small, small businesses, what innovation is really happening outside of the DOD. So with that, I'll, I'll first talk about resources, some of the resources we're topping in. Um, the first one kind of top middle, uh, AI savvy workforce. Uh, on one hand, we've been doing a lot of this stuff for a while now, right? Uh, Eglin's even just looking at Eglin alone, um, the cyber test group has been doing some kind of dabbling with uh, AI in different applications for cyber and um, you know, like uh, some of their, those different test programs. Right, the air for the munitions directorate has a uh, looking at doing autonomy and AI um, within the OG. We've been doing the ops group. We've been doing a lot of this as well. So there's a there's kind of a, a constituency here already of people doing it. And really, what ADX is trying to do is let's align these efforts and, and make sure we're sharing common tools. Uh, and this extends beyond Eglin, right? So we're working with folks um, uh, throughout the DAF uh, to include uh, uh, other Air Force test center bases like Edwards and some of the good work they're doing. Um, uh, going clockwise here, the digital synthetic range. So the challenge with a lot of autonomy in AI is you want to do it in the real world, but you can't between uh, the complexity of the scenarios you're trying to develop or uh, just the number of runs you need to do, like we need to have uh, sophisticated simulation tools. Uh, and I think the what we're building, uh, really excited about, we're kind of in the, the, the process of developing this is building an actual digital twin uh, of the Eglin range or parts of it at least to start so that I can do things in simulation and then I can do those same things on the live range in the real world and that helps um, I can actually like validate what's happening in the sim uh, and also start doing things uh, you know with a mixed reality right live virtual constructive so I can use parts of this high fidelity simulation uh, combined with actual flight tests and using things like restricted airspace and stuff to do things in the real world which that ties right next into the 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 bottom right there, Eglin's got some incredible uh, range space resources, right? Both large land ranges, but also, uh, you know, a, a giant water range kind of stretching from the, the panhandle to almost down to the Florida Keys. So there's a lot of opportunity to do stuff in the real world. And much like the chat GPT example, I think the more we can do things in the real world using actual hardware, um, one that just gives us confidence that these systems can can actually perform and it's not just you know simism type stuff um but two it also helps kind of like uh get better exposure to some of the challenges like operating in space just all the things you have to go through to make it happen i think there's value added in that as well the data and, and computing infrastructure uh maybe i'm preaching to the choir hopefully i think this is like the uh unsung hero of how all this works so I think everyone likes to see kind of the, the cool thing flying, the exquisite use of it, but like what's going on in the hood? How are you managing this data? Um, what kind of computing and network resources do you need to make this all happen? Uh, that is still something we're, we're growing and trying to develop. And so the goal is, you know, ADAX using CDO tenets, architectures, et cetera, how those, but let's start like doing that, iterating on those so we can kind of have a common playbook, you know, how we do data types, data formatting, things of that, so we can work better across different sectors, right? And then we, also we can look to how industry does it and interface better with what industry is already doing. Uh, and then test platforms, this is the fun part. We're getting a bunch of different small UAS uh, to include some larger, like the XQ58. We've got a couple of those uh, within the ops group that are, are perfect kind of surrogate platforms for testing autonomy uh, in the world. Uh, I also threw the Huey, the UH1 on there as well. I think it's important to know um, not all autonomy or AI has to be some kind of unmanned futuristic thing, right? You can use 
there's plenty of uh, opportunities for either sensors or, or you name it, where having a, a Huey, a good old Vietnam era helicopter where I can throw a bunch of stuff in the back or throw things out the side, um, that's can be an invaluable asset to some of this newer technology as well. And then lastly, um, autonomy at test infrastructure. I think we're seeing the rise of a lot more software kind of centric companies where they don't necessarily have the whole kind of they don't actually own any aircraft right so they're developing software autonomy uh, ai solutions but they need to host it and fly it on something uh, and currently we have kind of like a one-off every every single time we want to do something it's like we kind of have to start from scratch uh, to get like their software integrated on there's airworthiness assessments there's you know all kinds of um, safety implications of how you know fail safes etc and so what we're, we're building simultaneously is we're actually building like an autonomy test, like a sandbox, right? Where we give there's certain interfaces, we've got the hooks in place to allow for the modularity for different vendors to use, um, uh, to interface with this. So they, they could fly on our aircraft very quickly and it doesn't necessarily change any of our airworthiness or safety uh, implications. And so that allows that quick iteration, right? So I think a lot of, a lot of this testing in general, you need to be pretty flexible see where it breaks, fix it, come back, see if it breaks again. And that, that iterative nature is really important. And having an autonomy test infrastructure and kind of all the procedural stuff in place to allow for that rapid iteration and do it so safely uh, is crucial. Okay, now the fun part. So just a kind of a, a smattering of, uh, so I, I didn't give the background actually. So December, 2022 is when ADEX kind of officially kicked off. And so uh, over the past the course of the last calendar year, Kind of trying to grow the team, uh, figure out like there's been a lot of you know because we don't want to be necessarily another stovepipe, right? Another like we're doing cool things, but we're not talking to anyone. So there's been a lot of collaboration amongst um, people, um, especially kind of in closer to the small youth, uh, autonomy space, but like throughout throughout the DAF as far as like what's going on, some best practices, um, and then there's been a lot of work with AFWorks of like okay, how do we start doing some experiments, showing you know let's do something. Uh, so one of the things we did actually kind of in the spirit of large language models is we had a hackathon last fall where we took um, a number of open source language models, we put them in the vault environment, and then we used uh, some test specific documentation uh, and, and used that as like context to help kind of test specific large language models. And so we did that over the course of a week and learned a ton of things about, you know, how to integrate with that, you know, vault, some of the, there's just a cool thing about doing that. There's a lot of good lessons learned. Um, with the intent being, right, if we could get something like a chat GPT, right, that's not that's approved for CUI data, there's a lot of goodness that can come out of um, how that just makes our processes faster, right? Like uh, half the battle is just getting something on paper. And then once it's on paper, you know, iterating is a lot, a lot easier. And that's where like a large language model would be great. Um, so a lot of good lessons learned. And then kind of obviously roping in the larger task force and Lima and some of the stuff that's going on across. OSD for that kind of keeping our keeping a connection to that, but there's there's some some goodness from large language models. Um, kind of going right, Project Fox is a, a ongoing project for the F35 to have an app store that interfaces with the F35. Um, and so we've been haven't done a ton of stuff with them yet, but the goal is right as we have some of these opportunities for you know getting data, connecting, AI, you know, driving applications for AI. What kind of experiments can we do? How can we better leverage that resource? Uh, the top right is a good example of what we're trying to build as well. So we worked with a company called Near Earth Autonomy, and they wanted to test some of their stuff through AFWorks uh, at Eglin. And so part of our process is how do we make this, how do we streamline the getting kind of these companies that want to collect data and they can't do it because of certain issues of SARS, like flying in the national airspace system or you know their aircraft are too big. How can we leverage what we have here to help them, you know, get data faster and learn from them? So they were doing some autonomous detect and avoid, you know, auto landing stuff, and we were able to get them from kind of first point of contact to doing some actual flight tests on the range of an unmanned Group Three UAS in six weeks, um, which is actually pretty uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and we didn't necessarily have to break any glass, right? We're creating new processes so that there's some some goodness there, and that's paving the way for even faster and faster. Um, working with a safety office, like figuring out what risks are acceptable to take, like not being afraid to fail. Um, so there's there's so much goodness, and that's honestly for these small businesses, it's crucial because they can't wait three to six months to get on 
and get data like they need something you know in the week's timeline and so we're we're, we're making it there um i've shown it there's a number of uh, aircraft here so the xq58 um is this set there there's some really cool opportunities to use that as a like a fighter type surrogate aircraft um and then there's cheaper aircraft. We got like you know you can see this little the yellow aircraft. There's a, a Mark III Osprey. It's a little we call it a little yellow school bus. Carries 20 pounds of payload, which is perfect though because it can we put a little EOIR sensor on there, and we can kind of do some really interesting autonomy autonomous stuff. Um, it's less sexy obviously, but I think the real value is like what's kind of going on under the hood, right? The decision, you know, the networks, how how this is all working. Um, so there's there's a number of aircraft kind of autonomous things we're doing, but also if you look at the the bottom left there, we're also working with like kind of more broader collecting data for UAS traffic management. So let's say we get this figured out and we can do you know whatever the autonomous drone delivery like a, a, a last mile logistics, and you get you know orders of magnitude more of these aircraft flying around autonomously and they work great, right? How are you going to track that? How do you interface that with the system? How do we make sure that they don't fly into Kind of existing manned air traffic patterns. So there's a lot of work going on with NASA, the FAA on UAS traffic management. Um, and we have an opportunity here with an ADEX to help kind of start collecting data, doing experiments to kind of poke and prod some assumptions and, and provide data to inform better decision making. Um, and then another cool thing about being at Eglund, um, there's a lot of exercises that are going on in this area. So uh, Emerald Flag is something put on by the the uh, 96 test wing so that's an opportunity to to participate and, and bring ai and autonomous solutions there and then afsoc has a number of exercises as well that we can um, we're looking to participate in as well so uh a lot of great opportunity we've done some good stuff and i think as we get our feet underneath us there's a lot a better opportunity to continue to, to expand what that looks like okay training and education i it just listed i like this slide we um there's a lot of good resources out there um, and so I think half our half our thing is we look at you know developing workforce and you know getting people from different uh, levels of uh, knowledge appropriately for their their system. Like how much is required uh, or where, where to point them to. The other thing too is we've been putting out um, uh, publishing kind of uh, prompts and guides and such so that there's like a okay I want to test a AI what do I do like a start here. So we we have a field guide for prompt engineering. Um, we have an artificial intelligence test and evaluation primer that's like uh, almost ready for for it's finishing up its final two letter coordination. So that's hopefully uh, uh, you know a week or two away from being published by the CDO. Uh, and then also like an air domain autonomy test and evaluation handbook, right? And so there's a couple other ones we're looking we're working on as well. But the goal is as we do these experiments, right? Uh, as we kind of build up this how do we build this corporate knowledge how do we make sure that this isn't siloed and this is a, a perfect example of like best practices things we've learned um start here guide so that we're uh, we're at least you know giving people a, a, a block to step off of right, as opposed to having to learn the lessons their own the hard way so i think there's a lot of value in kind of documenting what as we're doing these experiments lessons learned etc um how to make sure that that that's passed on and then partnerships i think this is a, a cool one where this is something I think the OSD, the DOD in general, is trying to kind of grab their or you know wrap their arms around. So there's been a lot of good work with uh, joint partners, right? SOCOM, Army, uh, NAVAIR, NAVC. They're looking at autonomous type stuff. Um, again, it's that collaboration, lessons learned. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, and then also just as we have different resources and, and range types and expertise, like how do we kind of work across those areas um, that TRMC has been uh, been a, a key sponsor as well, specifically in some of the di digital simulation tools and, and how we test those test autonomy. And then just a lot of good synergy right now um, within the United or within the Eglin Enterprise, but also kind of throughout with Edwards Edwards Air Force Base as well. Uh, and that is all I have. So I guess I'm happy to open it up for questions. Has oh, I just realized I was muted. Thank you so much, Major Livermore. No worries. 
So we will open it up uh, to questions. If you haven't already, you can post them in the chat. And we do have a couple here. So we're going to start with uh, first question from Sandra Smith. Given that AI is dependent upon metadata and meta models, how is how are the areas of the problem, challenge, and experiment being addressed? Given that AI is dependent on metadata and meta models, how is the area? Mm, I don't. Let me see if I understand your question. So we're not necessarily so. I guess I can come from a couple different areas. Um, what I'll say, and so so one thing. So you you're totally right. Um, you know, for training data specifically, you have to provide. You have to have a, a pretty large corpus of of uh, information. Um, one of the reasons for the building the digital synthetic range is to um, oftentimes, right, if you, let's say, um, you know, whatever, just a classic like dog cat classifier. But if you only have certain pictures of cats in certain scenarios, right, like you, you could have a, a whole area where uh, you have a lack of data. And so I think that's where the digital synthetic range we're trying to do this for providing filling in the gaps of where data sets might be weak and providing that with synthetic data. Um, and, and I kind of gloss over a little bit of the kind of a whole nother brief on what we're building, but, you know, being it's like physical, like that's um, physics based imagery, right? So you're uh, so that that's kind of an area we're trying to provide that so we can help augment the training there. Uh, I think a lot of the experimentation we're looking at is after you have a trained model, right? Let's say, you know, decision engine, whatever, and you want to test and see how it does in the real world, like we've kind of have the test course where we can kind of get you on and see how well it does. Um, but and there can be, oh, but there's, there's a, <laughs> all of that depends on having some kind of contextualization of that data so that the models can learn or at least use Euclidean, you know, relationships to be able to understand and get better at prediction or simulation. So in in this framework, where is that metadata mediation happening so that we can further that work? I guess it's kind of it's hard to it's hard to answer in the abstract, right? So I think that's depending on the problem set right and depending on what the, the data needs are we kind of work with those we've been working on a case-by-case -case basis um we're not necessarily looking at like it's more the it's kind of the closer like providing early evaluation type or uh hand, you know first looks at how, how all this does i don't know if that that fully answers your question no but that's okay maybe this is a separate discussion okay all right, so the second question we have from John Gordon. What risks are you aware of of in implementing AI that can crawl your data sources uh, stores freely? So I have to, I guess maybe my, my um, I am probably the weakest of, if you were to say autonomy data and AI, I think data is probably the weakest of uh, my, my knowledge gaps now and kind of what the safeguards are in place we have, the, it's been fairly stovepiped, right? So we don't necessarily have this like one, you know, database to rule them all. Um, so our, our, I think we want to get to having a, you know, like more kind of an ecosystem where things are more interconnected. And then at that point that your, your concerns are, how do, yeah, how do you make this so that I'm not just scraping stuff or there's, you know, spillage where data that should be segmented is not, um, a lot of our experiments too have been kind of more or less at the CUI level, the um, you know distro D unclassified. Uh, there's a whole nother can of worms as far as if you have data sources that have data at various security levels and how do you manage those things. Uh, and I don't know if there's a, a clean answer. Um, I think what we're trying to do is is we can start doing. We're, we're hoping at least to some degree is like instead of just making decisions about this or policy decisions in the vacuum, we can start to like kind of poke and prod and, and actually like it's almost like a meta experiment right so like do that and make sure that there's not um like almost test the test and see like, again if, if it can get over there how does that affect things if that makes sense thank you 
All right, on to the next one. Uh, Mr. Jared Norris would like to know where he can locate the guides that you mentioned a couple of slides ago. Yeah, so the um, the field guide for prompt engineering, it's on the CDA of SharePoint. And I think my understanding too is once the TE any the AIT any primer is uh, you know finishing its two letter court, it will be published on the CDA share, SharePoint as well. So the goal is to keep those on the CDA of SharePoint for visibility's sake and, and common like a single source of truth. And if it's someone else bigs or whoever else is if that's wrong, then please jump in and correct me. All right, uh, Matt Martin, has there been any testing or concept development of the HMT or human interface pieces of supervising autonomous aircraft? Uh, I don't want to speak like broadly, like for you know for ADAC specifically. Um, right now, we've been more or less observing kind of what. So a lot of these performers and vendors have their own kind of flavor of HMI and HMT. Um, and a lot of the, for a lot of small US, I'll speak specifically for, that's kind of my, my what I know the most. Um, a lot of them are using Pixhawk autopilots or um, so like the Mavlik interface. And so there's some pretty creative um, solutions out there for how to manage things. Um, but I, we we haven't necessarily arrived to like, this is, this is like the best one we've seen. Um, and that's still something that's kind of an ongoing, like it's, it's definitely hard to, well, yeah. So there's, I wouldn't say there's been testing per se. Like we haven't like like gone out with a like really like a human factors like how good is it to manage a swarm, um, but there's been some work it's like kind of implicitly done as we kind of use those as a, a means for testing other parts of the autonomy. And Major Tumajong has a uh, two part question. So the first part, how can units or organizations partner with ADEX to test and evaluate Gen AI solutions? And second part, can ADEX sponsor ATOs for emerging AI capabilities for DAF adoption? Ooh, that's a good. Um, so I want the second one is tight. Um, not right now. Uh, we got to figure out the ATO piece as well. A lot of this has been kind of off. We're doing most stuff that's like off, um, you know, any kind of official network, right? So these are standalone kind of enclave systems. Um, the cyber test group has a lot more information. Uh, and I think the the big thing right now is uh, for partnering with ADAX, like you can reach out to me directly. Uh, the, there's some folks at the CDO who are at belly buttons as well. Um, Major Bogalski and uh, is one and then also yeah it depends like uh afworks is also another way so if there's some sibbers or sibbers and afworks is tr that's another way of getting in as well so there's a couple different avenues we're trying to formalize the plan is to make adex more of a formal thing that has kind of a, a better front end where we can kind of get people onboarded and, and get things through so that's something we're currently developing as well perfect all right and from Muli. Uh, we are building a large language model interface for tactical ISR, AFWORKS phase two contract from aerial vehicles. What is the process for conducting an experimental evaluation of this tool? Well, first of all, that's really cool. Um, there's not really a, there's not, there's not like a defined process, right? So I'd say the between, um, depending on who your sponsor is and like what we say experimental evaluation, you're talking about like having like, uh, you know, ISR system matter, system matter experts, subject matter experts interact with the, the tool itself, I'm guessing. Yes, that's uh, right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Approaching, okay, so, putting a tool on a drone flying around uh, with the EOIR payload and then running edge computing on the drone or running LLMs. Yeah, what I would do is I'd work through whoever your sponsor is, and then they could, if you want to kind of connect me, we can we can um, talk as well. Thank you. And from Joe, he's asking about the partnership slide. Um, he says the bottom right under AF is the Emerging Technologies Pack patch, the ETCTF at 412th Ops Group. Yeah, so now, yeah, it's now the Emerging Technologies uh, Integrated Test Force, and they're part of the, yeah, but they are the 412th Ops Group. And it looks like so far our last one, um, 
from James Prater. Does ADAX have any collaboration or integration with the Air Force MIT AI Accelerator? Yes. Um, it's kind of, again, right now we're at the loose confederacy. A lot of like, we're, I think we're all kind of trying to pull the rope in the same direction. Um, we don't have any like hard projects or experiments, but um, uh, Voodoo, if you know Voodoo, is that uh, the AI accelerators that there. So there's there's a lot of connection between us and we're kind of a lot of conversation, but nothing I could point to like, oh, we're doing this like really big thing together. Awesome. So I'm going to pause just a few more seconds just in case there's a last minute question. All right, perfect. Well, uh, Major Livermore, we really appreciate you and your uh, presentation today. We thoroughly enjoyed it, and we want to thank everyone for joining our February Innovation Connect. We're grateful for your continued support of DOD Innovators and the DAF CDAO as we celebrate over three years of the series. We have several pioneering projects underway and look forward to spotlighting each project and speaker. Our next webinar will host Ms. Asha Sugzina, the CEO and founder of Women's Leaders in De Data and AI, commonly known as WILDA. Ms. Sugzina will overview the organization, emphasize the need for diversity and inclusion for innovative solutions in data and AI, and break down complex AI concepts. Approved videos of our past events are available on the Department of the Air Force CDAO YouTube page. And as always, we welcome your recommendations for future Innovation Connect topics to our DAF CDAO communications mailbox. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you again.